Hello, everybody. It's John Conway uh, with um, Rexel Automation here in Western New York. We're fortunate to have uh, right from the manufacturer, Andres and Hauser e &H, as everybody knows them. Bill Chalette is going to be covering us, walking in through the measurement and a lot of the presentation. Um, so again, this is more informational for you and, and more of a lecture. So just some housekeeping. This is being recorded. Um, I will ask that if you have questions to put them in the chat, please, and that you keep yourself muted. Um, I respect to Bill and his presentation. We can open it up at the end for questions and, and answers for those. And uh, one other infomercial I'll plug in. I know Bill doesn't mind me bringing it up. His automation fair is uh, next month. And uh, Rockwell is, is hosting that virtually. Uh, was supposed to be in LA, but with uh, COVID, obviously it, it's been moved to a virtual format. And part of that now is that under it is the process uh, solution user group or PSUG, as those of you that know it is running. It is free to register. Um, labs are a fee depending on the labs but uh it is the 16th to the 20th and steve and i can get you more information on that but and and e &H will have a booth a virtual booth and will be heavily featured in the process segment uh, of it so if you if you don't find everything you need here steve or i can get back to you or we would highly recommend that since it is free and, and you don't have to travel to it you take some some of the piece of events that are be coming up so Bill, I, I, I'm going to turn it over to you from here and um, to, to go. And we allotted an hour, but Bill, I think we're probably going to be well short of that. And um, we, all, we just wanted to let people know that, um, again, if you're going to ask questions, put it in the chat. And then at the end, we'll open it up and, and you can come off mute. So, OK, Bill, call you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for giving me some time. Um, I'm the senior level products. Uh, business manager in the Northeast here uh, for Anderson Hauser. Just real quickly on me, I've been with Anderson Hauser eight years now. Um, prior to that, uh, in this role, and prior to that, I was with a company that you might know called Drexelbrook. I was with Drexelbrook for 33 years. So I've been doing level a long time. Um, hopefully I can answer your questions. I know where most of the bodies are buried at this point. And as I told uh, John, I will send this presentation over to you folks when I'm done and then if anybody wants it can have it. So just uh, start, we're gonna talk about some of the different level measurement products that are out there. Uh, there's a lot, of t a lot of them out there. I'm gonna talk about some of the more common ones. If at some point you decide you want more information on something that I don't go over, I can certainly come back and do that again and be happy to do a presentation on specific products and technologies. Um, so just starting out very quickly on level measurement, uh, this may be very obvious, but there are two types of level measurement. We have point level and continuous level. The point level is absence or presence. There's material there or it's not there. That's all you know. And it's typically used for things like high level, uh, overfill prevention, low level, uh, empty vessel indication, that kind of thing. Continuous level is just that. It tells you the product is zero to 100 percent, zero to 60,000 gallons. Um, and we offer, obviously offer both types of uh, products in our portfolio. There's a lot of level measurement technologies out there. Um, we offer most of them. This is a list of most of what we offer. Um, I've been around long enough to see a lot of new technologies hit the market, uh, even back to ultrasonic kind of getting stronger and then radar and guided wave radar. And, um, all those technologies, and, and it always seems like whenever a new technology comes out, it's like, oh, great, now we don't have to worry about anything, we just use that. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, all these technologies have good and bad application. And, uh, you know, if there was one technology that could do it all, there'd just be one technology. Everything would migrate to that, that would be the end of it. So we offer a lot of technologies for different applications, different types of measurements. And, and our job is to try to figure out what's the best technology for your specific application. I'm going to start with ultrasonic. Uh, Ultrasonic's been around a long time. Um, I'm going to try to stay away from any kind of commercials here. I might might be one or two in, in here, but I'm really going to focus on the technology, the do's and don'ts kind of things and how they work. Um, so hopefully that'll be of use to you. Just looking at ultrasonic, just to explain this picture, there's basically two types. There's the integral type, which is the probe mounted directly electronics, 
and then we have the remote versions, which is what you see on the right, where you have a control box, a transmitter, and then the remote transducer. But ultrasonic is what we call a time of flight technology. It's sending out an acoustic wave, sound energy, that travels to the surface of the material. When it hits the surface, the density of the surface causes it to reflect back again. And it comes back to the transducer. It measures the time it took to go down and back again. And time is equal to distance. So with all our time of flight technologies, the first thing we, we know is we don't measure level with any of them. Um, they're all measuring distance. That's why when you put a radar, ultrasonic guided wave radar into a vessel, you have to tell it, my zero point is this and my full point is that. Zero is 20 feet, I'm measuring a distance of 15 feet, therefore I have five feet of level. So that's how they work. <clears throat> now, ultrasonic is a very good technology when properly applied, as I mentioned before, but there are areas that you gotta be careful of. Um, it is much more um, affected by the environment than some of the newer technologies like radar and guided wave radar. Uh, moisture in the air is not a real big deal, very small or same, same with pressure changes. Uh, temperature is a big deal. The, 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 as the temperature changes, the speed of sound changes and you have to compensate for that. So all of our transducers have a, a RTD in them to measure the temperature and to compensate for that speed of sound through air change due to the temperature change. And that's not magic that Anderson Hauser does. Everybody who makes a, an industrial ultrasonic device is going to do that because it's absolutely necessary. The other thing we have to be careful of is what is the space above the liquid or solid that you're trying to measure? Is it air, which of course we just talked about changes speed of sound with temperature, uh, or is it some other gas? So if I get an ultrasonic and it's been, it's been calibrated for speed of sound through air, and I put it in a vessel that has a CO2 blanket in it, um, you can see the CO2, it's, it's much slower than the speed of sound in air. So it starts to measure, it goes down, comes back again, it takes a lot longer to get back and up and down again, and therefore it's gonna look like the level's further away than it actually is. You can do some compensation for that in the unit, but as temperature changes, it's going to be an issue. Um, as you see with helium, it's gonna be much faster, it's gonna the level's much higher than it actually is. So what I would suggest is if you are in a situation where you have a, a, a vapor space above the uh, liquid or solid that's not air, if it, especially if it's an organic material, if you're measuring gasoline or something like that, uh, I would not use ultrasonic in that application. I would go to a technology that doesn't care about that, like a, a radar, or guided wave radar. <clears throat> Placement in the tank, I know this seems silly, but I've seen it a number of times where someone would put the device directly above the fill stream and then they don't understand why it's going from zero to 100% immediately when they start filling. So you wanna stay out of the fill stream. You wanna try and avoid internal obstructions as best you can. Um, with a solid, we like to use that aiming flange to give us a shot directly towards the angle of repose. Uh, gives us a much better signal. Um, being close to the wall, while it's not ideal, um, we do have to consider beam angles. It, it, it isn't always the end of the world to be close to the wall. Uh, so I would just say to be cautious with that, uh, we can take a look at that. We can calculate how much the beam angle is gonna hit the wall. If we lose a little bit of energy, it's probably okay. If we're getting a lot of energy loss or if there's a lot of big weld seams and things like that on the wall, then uh, we'd wanna get it out away from that. And we don't wanna measure, we don't wanna mount a radar or ultrasonic in the middle of particularly of a dome roof tank. Directly in the middle, the dome acts like a parabolic dish. And it, when the energy goes up and hits the dome and comes back down again, it refocuses it and can cause uh, issues with secondary echoes that the ultrasonic or the radar can pick up on. And I'll show you that a little better when we get to the radar version. I get a lot of questions about foam. What, what happens if we have foam in the application? And the, the answer is, well, it kind of depends on the foam and looking at this, from left to right, we have kind of just some air bubbles in the, in the water or liquid, not a problem. The second one, we have kind of a light sudsy foam, not a thick blanket. Usually you can measure through that without too much of a problem. All the way to the right, we have a really dense foam, um, something like a, it, almost like a crusty foam you might see in some applications, wastewater, things like that. And the ultrasonic signal can bounce right off the top of that, it's so dense. And then we have the one in, uh, 
third from the from the left there that is somewhere in between that tends to absorb the energy and you lose your signal the acoustic energy goes down into the bubbles and they get scattered and absorbed and it doesn't come back again and you get what's called a lost echo failure in fall i would suggest this if you know you're going to have foam even if you think it's going to be a light foam um i would probably stay away from ultrasonic the, the problem with it is you don't unless you're really sure that you're going to get maybe a patchy little bit of foam in there once in a while. Um, sometimes you have that, but then next week you have a different change in the process and, and you get a big blanket of foam and then you're having problems. So foam with ultrasonic is usually a, a stop sign uh, for me. And, and there's other technology that will work much better with foam that we can look at. So we'll talk about that as we go. Condensation on the face of the transducer. Um, yeah, that could be a problem because the bubbles of water are gonna cause the acoustic energy trying to come out to scatter and possibly even reflect back and cause a near zone or uh, near zone fault or blocking distance fault. What we do is we have a uh, kind of a dynamic uh, cleaning in there. And since the, the piezoelectric crystal, which is causing the acoustic energy is a mechanical energy, that crystal is popping. We actually have a physical movement of that face of that transducer. When the transmitter starts to see energy coming directly back at it from, from the face of the transducer, it then knows that there's condensation on the face and it ramps up the frequency and it'll actually ramp it up and blast the water off the uh, face of the, of the transducer. And it works pretty well. Um, if you're interested, there is a YouTube video that shows how this works. This, these are cuts from that, these pictures, uh, but we've had good success with that. Um, as you can see here on this picture, we got a lot of condensation on that transducer, but that sweet spot in the middle where most of the energy is coming from is clean and it continues to work. So that is a, a overview of uh, ultrasonic. Now we're going to talk about radars. And the first thing I'm going to point out here, these are some of the radars that we offer today. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different antennas there. There's horns, there's, there's Teflon antennas, there's parabolic dishes. We have all these different antennas for different reasons, for different applications. Uh, for example, the, the horn is your typical radar device, kind of the general purpose device. But if you get a lot of condensation, you, you could have issues with that, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So we go to a Teflon antenna that will shed the uh, condensation. And if we have really long distances on low dielectric materials, then we might go to that parabolic dish, which really helps us focus the energy. <coughs> Excuse me. Technology sending a microwave pulse at the speed of light to the surface of the material that you're measuring, reflecting back and again, down and back again, uh, time divided by two equals distance. And again, we're measuring the distance from the radar to the surface of the material you're trying to measure. Unlike an ultrasonic on the right there that is reflecting off the density of the material, a radar or guided wave radar reflect off an electrical property called dielectric constant. And everything in the universe has a dielectric constant. A vacuum is one, and everything else is above that. Um, water, in this case, is very high on the dielectric scale. It's around 80. So when we send a, a microwave pulse out to hit that and get back again, we get pretty much all our energy back. Um, it's a very easy reflection to make. And, and there's lines on the side are what we call an envelope curve. The first pulse is the launch, and then the second pulse is the reflection from the surface, in this case, of the water. We look at something other than water, in this case, oil, which has a lower dielectric, down around two. Um, we see a different kind of phenomena happen with the radar device. So we get our launch, we get a return signal, which is smaller because we're our lower dielectric gives us less of a reflection. And then you'll see that we actually see the bottom of the vessel. We see a reflection from the bottom of the vessel because the microwave energy, excuse me, goes through the oil, reflects off the bottom of the tank and comes back again. And we can actually see that in our envelope curve. What we also see though is kind of a, a phenomenon where we have a differential in where the bottom of the tank is versus where we uh, get a measurement from. That's caused by the slower the microwave energy slows down a little bit going through the oil because it's higher than air in dielectric. We can sometimes use that differential to help us make a measurement. If we've got a really low dielectric, and when I say low dielectric, two is not particularly low, 
When we get down around 1.2, 1.3, that's really low. We're just above a vacuum. We may not get enough energy reflected from the surface to give us a good usable signal. But that differential between where the bottom of the tank is and where we're reporting it is directly proportional to the amount of liquid it's going through. And we can sometimes take that signal and use that to help us get a measurement in very low dielectric materials.